Hi, I'm Jen Barnes, and you're about to experience how to ditch the old ways of doing things, embrace your neurodivergence, learn tips and tricks to function optimally, and love yourself, neurodivergence and all. Welcome to the Self-Loved Woman Podcast. Meditation. I found that to be super, super helpful. Before I meditate, I always do some pranayama or breath work. For me, I choose Nadi Shodana, which is also known as alternate nostril breathing, because that's a balancing breath and it can help quiet the mind a, a little bit, like it makes it not quite as intense. So that can be a really, really nice option. Something I teach inside of Ascend is how to practice mindfulness the ADHD way. Hey, it's Jen. I'm so glad you're here. Today, I want to sh- let you in on a little secret about what I've been doing over the past year to skyrocket my confidence and trust in myself, really stepping into this role of digital entrepreneur and let you know like how I did that so you can do it too. So if that sounds interesting to you and you're like, oh yeah, I'm not super confident or I don't trust myself or whatever, then this one's for you. All right, y'all. So before I share this, I want to back up. I want to back up a ways, right? I was not always someone who really knew to take care of mental health. I started out with a math degree and taking actuarial exams and ended up in a therapist's office, which I didn't even know what a therapist was at the time with anxiety and depression, which I also didn't know what that was at the time either, right? This is like 25 years ago now, maybe 26, I think. But I had no idea what was going on. I had very little self-awareness, if any, because my whole life I had been cutting myself off from how I felt and what I wanted in order to mask my ADHD through people-pleasing and perfectionism and, like I've talked about before, over-functioning and high achievement. And I certainly know other people have found other ways to make their way to adulthood with ADHD. That was just how little Jenny figured it out. (laughs) So that was what she did. And it worked for a while until I really, really struggled in my twenties with anxiety and pretty severe depression, actually a lot of suicidality. And over time, I have found ways to increase my confidence and my ability to trust myself. And there are things that I've done since then, but especially in the last year, I doubled down on some of these things. So I want to back up to some of the first things I did when I was in my twenties that helped me shift that because I was very attuned to my self-talk. I paid a lot of attention to how I was speaking to myself. And I like to talk about parts now. This was long before I knew anything about internal family systems or IFS or recognizing parts, but I would talk to the feelings I had inside of myself. And I had a sense that there was like this meanie inside of me beating me up. My therapist used to call it going to beat up. And it just was so critical and so mean. And as I started to pay attention to that inner critic or voice, I started to get curious about it and even start to, I don't want to say defy it, but have conversations with it. What if we did the best we could, or instead of saying, oh, that was stupid saying, that's not my first choice of how I would have handled that. Or Oh, this is a learning lesson and being able to be lighter about it. And sure, there was some inner work I needed to do to get there. But that shift was huge. Being able to start talking to myself more kindly. And it's not that I smushed down anything like the the parts that thought I was bad. I had to work with those eventually, you know, back in the nineties, they told us to smush it down. So I did temporarily, but what I would recommend now, if you still have kind of shitty self-talk, which again, not a moral judgment. It's just the truth. If you're beating yourself up, what I would recommend is really leaning in and getting curious and being like, Hey, what are you concerned would happen if you talk to me nicely? (laughs) Because a lot of times the answers will be, well, you'll fuck shit up. Ooh, I don't know if I've ever said the F bomb on my podcast. Here we go. It might be what it is, is that 
those parts that beat you up inside are keeping you from messing up and keeping others from having the opportunity to beat you up. Because if you beat yourself up first, especially if you do it aloud to people, then they're less likely to do it to you as well, because it can be hard to kick someone when they're down, right? No matter how frustrated you are with them. Not that people don't do that, (laughs) but people are less likely to kick you when you're down if you're already super down on yourself. And so a lot of times we learn to do that. So one of the first things that helped me improve my confidence was to stop beating myself up for everything, but especially for mistakes or things that didn't go as intended. And I talked in our last episode about that, like, you know, failure isn't failure. Mistakes are just learning opportunities. And I actually believe that. I really, really believe that that narrative about failure being that you failed and you're bad is just completely unuseful, especially when you consider Carol Dweck's work on the fixed versus growth mindset, right? She's written a whole book about having the fixed mindset, which is you believe you have it or you don't. And so then failure means you don't have it. So you, at all costs, you avoid admitting you failed. And she uses John McEnroe as an example of that. So any of you who are in my generation, you remember John McEnroe. If you are younger than me, you may not, but he was a tennis player in the eighties and he would lose his mind if he missed a point and he would blame everything except take responsibility himself. And he has since read the book and admitted, yeah, you know what? She's right. I was in the fixed mindset. And if I'd been in the growth mindset and saw every single mistake as a learning opportunity, I would have been an even better tennis player. And he was a pretty amazing tennis player as it was. She also talks about the growth mindset, talking about people who were even, some might say more successful in their craft than John McEnroe was because they were able to look at mistakes and things that didn't go as intended and practice a new way of doing it. People like Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods. And when we have the growth mindset, we actually grow, right? And move away from being stuck in badness and shame and all that kind of stuff. And guess what? Boost your confidence. Not only because you're no longer beating yourself up for the smallest mistakes, but also because you're actually seeing progress. But it's pretty hard to see that progress if you're actively beating yourself up inside, because that can make it hard to put yourself out there. So that is one of the things I did early on to really shift my confidence. I would be remiss not to mention that if I'm going to talk about things that help my confidence. Over the years, there have been a lot of things. And what I will tell you has helped me a lot is that I have this beautiful morning routine. And I know that not everyone has the ability to do this in their life. Like if you're a mom with kids and you're working, this is probably not going to look the same for you. What I will tell you is I have this lovely morning routine that involves things like exercise and yoga and meditation. And during COVID, when I first started building this business, right at the beginning of COVID, it was April of 2020, I started building my ADHD business. I felt like all my extra time had to go to this business. I was skimping on my practices. I still did them because I know the importance of keeping up a habit once you have it, because it can be hard to build habits, but it's easier to maintain them. So I would still do each of these practices, but I was doing between two, maybe one and five minutes of meditation, maybe yoga once a week. I was still exercising my full 45 minutes to an hour every day. So that still was great. I was still doing my gratitude journal. But my morning writing practice, which is three pages, was getting down to like half a page sometimes, maybe one, but I was lucky. And that was for like three and a half years. All the while I was working full time in one business and working my ass off to build the other. And yeah, it was during COVID for the first part of it. So there wasn't much to do anyway, but still it wasn't an ideal business model because what it was doing is it was shifting me out of alignment. And I didn't realize that's what was happening at the time. I was just so focused. I was hustling. I was hustling. And I knew that I needed to increase those practices. I knew it would help me, but I wasn't actually able to make that shift until almost a year ago where I really was like, you know what, Jen, your energy is what attracts people. Your ability to help people comes from that beautiful energy that you have and it's depleted 
and it's depleted because you haven't been caring for yourself the way you know you need. And I will tell you as an, as a therapist who has ADHD, I may need more self-care than the average therapist or person. I don't know. But what I do know is that because I work with women in complex who have complex trauma histories in my private practice, I know that I need a good amount of self-care. Like I'm talking like two hours a day at least. And some people might be like, oh, must be nice. Sure. And it's necessary for me to be able to function with the work that I do so that it means there's other things I don't get to do as often, like go do fun stuff. Like tonight I'm going to a twins game, so I'm super excited, but it was rare before that I was getting out and doing those kind of fun things. So in the last year, there's some things that I re-upped or increased, but there's also some things I stopped. So before I get into the practices of the morning routine and what is so helpful about it, I want to talk about the things that I stopped. What I noticed is there were things that were draining my energy. They were energy suckers. And I noticed it for a while, not just in the last year when I stopped, but I didn't know how to stop before then. These were things like binging Netflix or freebie or whatever it was at the time, scrolling social media like a lot while I was watching said TV. And for some people, maybe watching six episodes is binging. For me, watching more than one is a binge because that's not a way I want to spend my time. I'd rather spend my time reading. And so I tried several ways to get myself to not watch so much TV because for me at the end of my life, I don't want to be like, dang, I watched a lot of really good TV in this lifetime. That was rock star lifetime right there. And I'm not shaming anyone. Like if you love TV, I'm not saying you can't, it's just not what I want to do. And so for me, it was important that I stopped this habit that I view as negative for me in my life. And so I tried lots of things. I tried timers. I tried uh, what did I, I, there was something I tried before hiding my remotes. I can't remember what it was, but then I tried hiding my remotes. Then I tried hiding my remotes in such an inconvenient place that I have to get a step stool out and move things out of my cupboard to be able to reach where it was. And eventually I broke through it all. I was like, Oh yeah, it would work for a while. And then I would eventually get to it and be like, it's okay. I was just going to watch one episode, but one turned into two what I ended up doing is unplugging my TV and knock on wood. I mean, hopefully it sticks. Cause sometimes when I talk about these things, all of a sudden the universe is like, are you really doing good with this Jen? Let's test it. So <laughs> pray for me <laughs> But in all seriousness, unplugging my TV was what I needed to do because for me to watch TV again, I would have to reset up Comcast because I actually not only unplugged my TV, I unplugged my Comcast box. So like for me to have to set that all up again is a ginormous pain in the behind. And there's no way I'm going to do that. It's just no way. So that's what it took for me to take that out of my life and create space for what I do want. The other thing I started doing was using Screen Zen. It's an app on your phone to really limit my ability to be on social media. And I got to tell you that app is amazing. It creates all kinds of friction or barriers to accessing your social media accounts. Like it makes it a huge pain in the ass. So then you get to, it stops you along the way and go, do I really want to do this? Cause there's so many points of decision that you're able to catch yourself before you're just randomly opening it. And it's helped me so much. I still go on social media, especially for my business and to interact with people like you who might be on my Instagram account, but I'm not on it as much as I was. So Screen Zen really, really helped. I also stopped getting into conversations that were not meaningful for me. And that doesn't mean I was like, oh, your conversation's not meaningful. I'm exiting now. Bye-bye. But sure, I still am friendly to the people at the grocery store and things like that. It's just that I'm more intentional about the conversations I have when I'm out in public, who I'm interacting with, how I'm interacting with them, why I'm interacting with them. Not that I'm not relaxed and having fun, but I just am trying to surround myself with positive people who are doing things 
like what I'm trying to do in the world. And it, it's made a huge difference. So those are the things I shifted or stopped doing, shifted out of or stopped doing to be able to make this big shift in my energy, in my confidence, in my frequency. I don't know if I started with this. This is the whole reason I'm thinking about this. So I may have to jump back. The whole reason I'm thinking about this is I was on a call in a program I'm in and I hadn't seen one of the people on for a while, or I hadn't spoken while she was on. And I got on to ask a question and she actually asked if she could comment something to me. I was like, sure. She's like, my gosh, what did you do? You're so much more confident, sure of yourself and clear than you were before. Your energy is so much more aligned. And that's why I'm sharing this because it's clear from the outside. I feel it inside, but I want to share how I got there because I know people are seeing and feeling it on the outside too. Okay. So those are the things I stopped doing to get here. What I maybe not started doing, but really stepped back into more fully over the past year were these morning practices that I have. I start out every morning with a gratitude journal. It's the first thing I do when I get up in the morning and I don't just put things in there. I mean, I was for some of COVID because I was so tired. It was more going through the motions, but a lot of times when I'm jotting something down in my gratitude journal app, which is like bullet points, they're numbered, I think anyway, whatever. I actually connect with the thing that I'm feeling grateful for. I feel the gratitude in my body. I feel the energy of what it's like to have that in my life and feel that appreciation on a deep level as I write each of those things. And that is amazing, both in the sense that we know gratitude, practicing gratitude decreases depression, increases happiness. It helps with sleep. There's all kinds, I think it decreases inflammation if I remember correctly. There's all kinds of amazing things practice of gratitude can do. But when you practice it like that, with that felt sense of appreciation, you're actually increasing your ability to manifest. You are signaling to the universe. I love this. Bring more. Thank you. Bring more. So that type of gratitude practice has been particularly key for me to really get back into doing more than just running through the motions over the past year. After I do that, I go do like my lemon water and feed the cats. So that piece isn't really exciting. The next thing I do is I write for three pages and it's stream of consciousness. So I just free write, brain dump, whatever comes up. And the most common thing I hear from ADHD women is that when they go to write, their brain goes faster than their hand. That's okay. I, my hand just writes whatever it gets. It doesn't have to be like accurate. No one's going to check and make sure that your dictation is perfect. (laughs) In fact, I wouldn't even care about spelling, finishing sentences, any kind of grammar. I would just write because what you're doing is you're getting it out of your head you're getting all the gunk out, you're processing things. Sometimes I'm writing and acknowledging parts of me coming up. And that might be like, oh, there's a part of me right now that feels this way. Or I might be saying something like, oh, I feel like crap. Oh, there's a part of me that feels like crap. So it can be a little bit of both, but just to acknowledge that and say, oh, what's that about? And get curious can be a great way to get some IFS in internal family systems or parts work in to connect on that level. But even just getting whatever's in your brain out, processing things, it's amazing the beautiful ideas that come to me when I give the universe the opportunity to write through me in that way. So I highly recommend a writing practice if you can. That has been tremendously helpful. Following that, I meditate. And I was before COVID meditating between 10 and 15 minutes a day. Now I'm between 12 and 14. So I've gotten back up there and I will do that. Even if it means cutting my workout short, I'll make sure I get at least my 12 minutes before it used to be the other way around. I would skimp on meditation just to get my full workout. And what I'm realizing is yes, my workout is important. My exercise is important. They're both important. And I feel much better served if I can get in at least 12 minutes of meditation, even if it means I get five less less minutes of exercise. The world hasn't ended there. 
because I go for walks and stuff during the day between clients, which I'll talk about in a moment. It's just that there is such a importance to creating that space to sit in meditation. And if you're like, Jen, I have ADHD, I can't meditate. Let me back up. It's tough. It can be tough. I understand our thoughts move quickly. The only reason that's a problem is because you probably think in meditation, your thoughts aren't supposed to be there, that you're supposed to like somehow quiet your mind, which is ridiculous. Our brains think that's what they do. And our ADHD brains move quickly. That's what they do. So to expect your brain to be entirely quiet when you're meditating is ridiculous. It's just absolutely asinine. And I can't believe I said that word. That's so old, (laughs) but it is, it's just ridiculous. Instead, what we do is we have something be the focus of our meditation. And when our thoughts bring us out of it, we just bring our attention back. That is actually the process or the part of meditation that improves your ability to focus. It's actually getting distracted in meditation that helps you improve your concentration and focus with ADHD. So instead of stressing and be like, I can't meditate. My brain's too busy. That's like part of the point is your brain is busy. Notice it's busy. Let it go to the background. When it comes to the foreground and distracts you from whatever you're trying to focus on in your meditation, go, oops, it is. There it is. I'm going to shift it to the background, refocus on my breath or my mantra or whatever you're doing. And that is training your brain to direct your focus and concentrate. That's part of what helps, what makes meditation help ADHD so much. And if you're like, I can't do seated meditation, do some yoga, do some Qigong, do some Tai Chi, go for a mindful walk where you're not also on your phone. Nothing against phones per se, but they can be a ginormous distractor from living more of a grounded, authentic life. So I think it's something worth thinking about. So meditation, I found that to be super, super helpful. Before I meditate, I always do some pranayama or breath work. For me, I choose Nadi Shodana, which is also known as alternate nostril breathing because that's a balancing breath and it can help quiet the mind a a little bit. Like it makes it not quite as intense. So that can be a really, really nice option. Something I teach inside of Ascend is how to practice mindfulness, the ADHD way. And And it really does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. So there is a way to do it. And I want you to know that. After I meditate, since January, I've been doing this vision activity that my teacher talked about in his mentorship program. And it has been amazing. It's a vision for my business and my life. And it's a certain practice and with music. And I've done it every single day, almost every single day. I've missed a couple here and there, but not really more than a few. And it has been tremendously powerful doing that because I'm clear on what I want and I'm drawing it to me and I'm trusting that it's coming my way. So really making sure that's in there. That's been in there the whole time because I only started it in January. So that's newer. But that's one of the things that's increased my confidence and trust in myself because I'm seeing these things start to come to me already. And it's amazing. After that, I do an Oracle deck reading. I have these beautiful, like it's an energy deck. I think it's by Sandra or Sandra Brown. And they're these beautiful like angels. And someone I know is like, yeah, and the men are sexy. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, maybe, <laughs> like, but they're really pretty pictures and they each represent different things. And so I do a little card reading for myself every morning. I do a card pull asking spirit, what guidance it has for me that day. And I found that really, really helpful for continuing to build my intuition and be able to see what's going on around me and respond to that. As part of that, I've also been doing a course on improving your connection with your intuition and reading a book about it. So that's helped too. I mean, that's there for sure is being, and being able to trust yourself is trusting your intuition. That's another piece of it, but that's a conversation for a whole other time. So building your ability to trust your intuition can help. And I find those Oracle deck card pulls are a really nice, easy way to do it. You can get them all over. You can get a bunch on Amazon. There's like all kinds. There's ones with animals and probably one with insects, all kinds of them. You can certainly do tarot. I don't know how to do tarot, but the energy Oracle decks are a lot easier to navigate if you've never done anything like that. 
after that, after I finish getting ready and then I go exercise and I usually do exercise that is fun and empowering for me, which almost always involves some kind of dance, usually Zumba or bar. I do have some strength training days because that's important. Strength training is really, really important as we age, especially to have longevity and mobility. So if you aren't having, it helps you maintain your weight better too, especially as you age. So strength training is really important, especially as you're hitting perimenopause. Of course, only exercising as your doctor recommends, be clear. (laughs) But I have found strength training to be really, really helpful. It's something I've done since I was 20 and it's been a really great thing, but sometimes I have to make it more fun for myself because I tend to do similar exercises, listening to different kinds of music or trying something a different way or mixing and matching my outfits, which is silly shooting Instagram reels. Cause then you feel like someone's watching you. So it's more exciting and fun. So you're like, Ooh, okay. I'm going to try extra hard. It's not just me in my garage anymore. So it does help when neighbors walk by sometimes and I can feel them watching me and I'm like, okay, I got to work extra hard right now. I don't know why that is like, I care, but it's interesting how you get that motivation when other people are around. So after I exercise, I really, and this is just in the last few months, been getting in at least five minutes of yoga every day. Now, of course, today I didn't get it in because I was running late to get my hair done. But I find that if I can get that yoga in, I feel so much more settled, especially if I could get close to 10 minutes. And this doesn't have to be a crazy intense practice. Yes, I'm a yoga teacher, so I know how to put together a sequence, but none of what I do for my five to 10 minute yoga practice is rocket science. None of it requires you to know what a yoga teacher knows to be able to do it. And so I have found that to be so helpful. And I will tell you that I always make sure to include Shavasana because there's something about lying on the ground like that flat, that is just so settling in a way that not much else is, at least for me, I can tell you that. I know sometimes with complex trauma, Shavasana or rest can feel kind of uncomfortable. So you may find a different way. You can choose a different way that helps you feel more settled or grounded. It might be stomping your feet into the ground and feeling the earth beneath you, but whatever it is, that's it. The other practice I've really worked on getting more in, I'm not doing it as well as I did when I lived in Colorado Springs. When I was in Colorado Springs between every single client, I would go for a walk around the block. My office had a very short block and it took about four minutes and I could walk around it during the spring. I would stop and smell the lilacs and I would look at the trees. It was so fun. And in the winter, it was pretty mild there. So it wasn't as much of a deterrent as it can be in Minnesota. And during COVID, I actually was pretty good about going for walks between clients because it was an opportunity to get out of the house. So I'd put on my boots and my parka and in the winter and go out. And in the summer it was gorgeous. And I got to pet dogs. People sometimes will let you pet their dog and sometimes not because no one knew how it would spread back then. So it was iffy, the whole thing. But anyway, once COVID was done and I got back into my office, I don't know what happened, but I stopped going for my walks between clients as often. Well, I know what happened. I was hustling. I was hustling. I was like, oh, I just need to do this email real quick. Or I just need to do this real quick. And as with ADHD, nothing is real quick. And I would have been so much better served and have been better served since and was before by taking that four or five minutes and going for a walk around the block. That has helped tremendously. That helps confidence, but it just even helps just your general sense of groundedness because you're out in the world, outside, outdoors with trees and flowers and birds and squirrels and dogs. Who doesn't love to be around dogs? And that in and of itself was a big shift. Now I might be thinking, wow, Jen, that's all amazing. There's no way I could do this for myself. You're very disciplined. And you heard me talk about in a recent podcast that there's no such thing as discipline. I look like I'm disciplined from the outside, but each of these habits was built one at a time, very slowly over time with the exception of exercise kind of Well, even that was built slowly. I started by just running around Coma Lake, which if you're from the Twin Cities in Minnesota is 1.6 miles or 1.54, depending on which way around you go. If you go the little extra bill bit there up the hill, but I started doing that and that didn't take very long, like 20 minutes. And then 
in college, I went up to running for half an hour and eventually I got up to running six miles a day in college and all the way through my twenties. And in addition to teaching group fitness and doing those kind of things and lifting weights. And so even my exercise practices built up slowly over time, as did my gratitude practice meditation. I would meditate for one minute because at first it felt overwhelming. So I would do one minute and the little dinger would go off and I was like, yay, I did it. And I celebrated it because I was excited. I did something new. So remember comparison is the thief of joy. It's not about comparing your brand new one minute to someone else's 30 minutes. It's about celebrating that you did it. So if you're wanting to try some of these things, I recommend picking one, one that you think will give you personally the biggest bang for your buck right now and giving it a go, starting slowly, not shaming yourself when you miss. And if I can recommend having a better than nothing goal that you do every day, no matter what. Now, granted, I did my better than nothing goal for about three and a half years, the first three and a half years of this business. And that didn't really work great for me to do that long, but it can be great to be intermittently there as a backup, but then you try and do a little bit more. All right. That's what I got for you today on how I like 10 X my confidence in the last year is I returned to those practices and got rid of stuff that was sucking the life out of me. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you did, and you think someone who might, I would love it if you would share the self-love woman way podcast and be sure to follow. Take care. <music>